I'll cut this out inside baseball. Okay. Do you think we should re-record that section? I feel like I kind of just bungled it at the beginning by like kind of conflating the player order and asymmetric balance. I just feel like we could do better. Sure, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I no, I, I was just at the late like don't pool drinking beer. No. I feel it's like a little bit fried. So I I think you were good. And I think we're both madmen for even trying to do this Sunday night. But like here we are. <laughs> so all right, let's, let's, do, it. let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Talking back. Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brennan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And today we are talking about balance in games, a throwback what we talk about episode. We have a lot of thoughts on this one. There's no one I would rather be talking about this very subject with than Brendan Hansen. So it's going to be a great episode. We don't know right now if we're going to spill over into two episodes or just do one. So our plan is to just go hard at our notes and see where we're at in an hour. (laughs) These are some of the like most comprehensive dense notes I think we've ever produced for what we talk about episode, let alone any episode of the show. And it's not that they're that long in terms of content, but the breadth of each of the subjects that we have here, Jake, there's just a lot to unpack. And I feel like, you know, people write entire books about this subject. So we'll (laughs) see. We shall yeah, see. But I feel like this is the exact type of subject that we created this show in part to discuss, right? You hear totally. terms like balance thrown around all the time in board game dialogue. And I think it's another case, just like decision space, our namesake, where a lot of people are using this term and meaning a bunch of different things. There's a lot of nuanced, different parts all tied up together under that sort of umbrella term. So we're going to try and pick it apart uh, and and think a little bit deeper about it on this episode. So I think it's going to be great. I can't wait. Same. And before we do that, can we balance out the content a little bit with a review of the show, Jake? Yes, please okay. read it. This review Keep is titled... the train going. Yeah, we've had... This is many, many episodes at this point, I think. This review is titled Details with Charm, and it is a 10 out of 10. Five stars out of five stars. Here it goes. It was left on Apple Podcasts, by the way, from a listener in the United States. I enjoy listening to these gentlemen. They explain well and give details that clearly identify games. Telling a time frame is helpful to me as well. They both list positive and negative aspects. Thank you for creating this podcast. Thank you for leaving that review, Details of Charm. It means so much to us to get reviews of like this from the show because it really does go a long way in the discovery of the show. We've just seen... a. A dramatic and sort of robust growth. And I think a huge part of that is the passive promotion of our th- show through algorithms like Apple Podcasts, which is largely dictated by reviews like this. So thank you so much, Details of Charm, and all of you who have taken the a minute out of your day to go leave yeah. a beautiful five-star review like this for us. Yeah. And this is the last one we have like in our bag of reviews. So if you haven't left one and you enjoy this show, please do. I'd love to keep that going because it just makes us so happy. The other thing I'll say about just the discoverability piece, Brendan, you don't know this, but every once in a while I get email from like Google that tells me how many like downloads we have on Mm. uh, Google podcasts or whatever it is. Oh, sure. Okay. And in that email, it tells me like discoverability metrics, like how many people have found this podcast through Google search. That's really cool. Guess how many? Like, I don't know. I don't, I feel like it's not going to be very high. (laughs) Just guess. No, <laughs> like through through search, two hundred zero. No, oh, my work on the website. Well, it just means to me that you know we're growing organically by people Word sharing the show with other people they like, which is awesome. So thank you all for doing that. But enough of that, Brendan. <laughs> what do you say uh, we get right into our conversation? <laughs> So like with most what we talk about episodes, Jake, let's just start at the definition, which I think in this case is going to be trickier said than done. But sort of what is balance to you when you're talking about balance in the context of board games? Yeah, so I was thinking a lot about this. uh, And I think that balance gets conflated very heavily with the term fairness. Mm. So I wanted to ask this question at the very front to you, do you think balance and fairness are fundamentally different things or is are they synonymous in the context of board gaming? I think they're different things, but 
I do agree that people use them similar ways, right? Because a fair game, there's a lot of things that come to mind for a game that we would talk about colloquially as being fair that would be the same as a balanced game, right? So like a fair game, I feel like means that when we both sit down at the table, if we have equal skill levels, all of the things equal, we have an equal chance of winning. Yeah, I agree. That's where I'm at on fairness, right? When we're sitting down to begin the game, you know, relative to our skill, our skills should be sort of our relative to our chance of winning, not one to one, right? That's not to say there's no room for randomness or anything like that. But, you know, over the course of time, equal skill, equal chance of winning. That makes sense to me for fairness. That's kind of the goal of balancing games typically is right to create as fair a game as possible for players who want a competitive experience okay to go all the way back to your question on what's the definition of balance i think for me i'd like to try this definition on and see how it feels for you but i think balance is fairness like with respect to a position in a game so yeah so once we've started a game at that point things can become quickly very unfair so for Mm. example tic-tac-toe a game we're all familiar with brendan if we sit down to play a game of tic-tac-toe that is a fair game i think we both have a very equal chance of winning that game however as soon as we determine the start player Mm. then you know the chance of winning the game has dramatically shifted from that point and i think to me that is a case of like a game that game is fair when we go into it but unbalanced right at the start with like respect to turn order so based on your position in the game it's all of a sudden unbalanced interesting okay so (laughs) by that definition jake what would be an example of an unfair game like it yeah i mean an unfair game to me and i think people are you know really good in general of understanding like when situations aren't fair so i don't know if this is gonna if this gets like too meta or whatever but like what if at the start of the game players with blue eyes get 10 bonus points yeah unfair right that's unfair not respect to skill just respect to like something like outside of the game. Yeah. Or bring it to more of like a strategy Euro type of long-term thinking. I think in the mid 2000s, there was a lot of discussion of should all players have the exact same number of turns because that's going to make it even more fair. And you might have a balanced game where that's not true. Like some players, the first player is maybe more likely to have more turns than all the rest of the players. But in terms of outcome, in terms of win rates, maybe the game looks pretty balanced even if it's not fair from that point of view, for maybe nuanced reasons, like maybe going first actually isn't the best because you get more information based on what other players do. But in the moment, it feels unfair. I feel like another thing here too, Jake, is sometimes psychologically, and I think we get into this a lot in what we talk about. Yeah, I don't want to get, you know, get too far down the road in sort of defining the way balance can show up in a game. But I think that's sort of what I'm trying to get at with my definition, sort of like balance is like fairness that's happening within a game, right? Once the game has become, that's when, you know, we're thinking more about balance. So at any point when players are making decisions that they feel that they've been offered a fair opportunity at winning might be a a different way of sort of contextualizing this definition of like fair and balanced within a balanced game, I think is what you're saying, Jake, like, no one's likely to just like, would it be a fair game if you had a single card in the deck that just said, when you draw it, you win the game? Maybe it's a deck of 100 cards. Maybe it would be. I don't know. I mean, right. So I think that's when we get to like these toy games where it's just, you know, flip a coin. I'll flip a coin. Brendan, if you call it right, you win. If you call it wrong, I win. Sure. That feels like a fair game. Right. Or we each roll a d6. So how is that different than having a you win card in the deck and we're just drawing till we get it? Like like both of those are fair. Totally. But I think what we we're getting at here is this like concept of balance leads to meaningful play, right? So like we can make toy games just like yes. that, right? Like yes, each, exactly each of us right. are going to roll a D6 and whoever rolls the highest value wins the game. If we tie, we roll again. That's a balanced game. That's a fair game, but it's not necessarily all that fun or all that meaningful. And I think we all want our games and our play to be fun and meaningful or maybe not fun, right? There's lots of reasons why we play games and we'll get into that and reasons why you might not want a balanced game and it could make the play meaningful. But from a competitive perspective, I think balance is like you said, uh, oh, let me see how to contextualize this. Balance <laughs> is a, within the system, there's a degree of opportunity for all players to have an equal opportunity at winning from the start 
and then to make strategic decisions throughout the game that are roughly equal in terms of the potential that they could win given the right game state to take that objective. And there's so much to unpick there and yes. it's not a very clean definition and we'll get into it. I think it, that's but... a really good definition though. Okay, great. I'm like 100% with you on like the crafting meaningful gameplay decision yeah, yep. point of that because yeah, there are a lot of fair games that are not fun uh, and balance I think goes a long way therein. And I think the biggest issue with unbalanced games is that they can start to feel frivolous, right? If we spent 40 minutes making decisions, executing our best, and we still lose even though we played our very best, that doesn't feel like a good use of our time. So it doesn't feel meaningful. Or if a game has maybe too much un uncertainty, too much randomness, we invest an hour of our time and then someone rolls a d6 and just wins, all of a sudden that can feel sort of not as meaningful as we want. And I think as humans, we all just want to do things that feel meaningful, whether it's like cooking ourselves breakfast or building something or doing a job. We want there to be meaning in it. And I think it's the same way with play typically. Yeah, I think, yeah, well said. And I think we'll get more into sort of the nuance of how balance is showing up in games as we go further and you've actually come up with two distinct types of game balance that we're going to talk about here so i'm i'm trying to now in classic what we talk about fashion jake has thrown a wrench <laughs> at the notes right before we start recording which is great because i have this like fairness frame or lens in front of all it, of our notes is, is the is that serving us do you think the fairness i think it frame? is okay i think it is but maybe we'll pull the lens up at some point and just kind of keep us focused on balance but yeah I just want, I, I feel like I've confounded things a little bit and I really just want to try and like draw a distinction between those two things because totally. I do think a game can be fair and unbalanced is sort of your point. I like sort it. of the point that I'm trying to make here, but yeah. most balanced games are fair. I think, I, I think let's, so. we'll come back let's, to it. We'll yeah, come back to it. Let's answer that at the end. Okay. But roughly, I think when people, you were talking, Jake, at the beginning of the episode about how lots of people use the word balance and it sometimes is one of those like big board game words that kind of is a catch all mm -hmm. and it means a few different things. So two of the ways that I sort of, through doing lots of research, listening to old episodes of Ludology, reading lots of things on Board Game Geek, doing some uh, reading in some of my tech textbooks that I have, like characteristics of games from Richard Garfield, came up with these sort of like two-ish buckets of sort of player player order slash asymmetric balance. I think both of those things are really the same thing. If we're not making simultaneous decisions throughout the game every single point, turn order is a small asymmetry. And then asymmetric balance is something as far as like root, right? Or cosmic encounter. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. But that type of balance is really like, do all players have an equal chance of winning the game before they make any decisions, right? Are the tools that I'm given or the position in which I'm given to make a decision creating an unbalanced game state? That means that I have a higher chance of winning from before we start playing than Jake does. And then there's strategic balance, which is once we start playing, are all options roughly equal or viable in the game? Excuse me. And I've put about 30 asterisks here because <laughs> I think this gets murky, but the idea is like not all options are viable all the time. Yeah. But on average, is there a nuanced sort of varied set of strategic options presented to the player or if if that's what the game is going for some games there's really only one strategy and it's about executing that core strategy really well but if the game is trying to have multiple strategies is there a reason for them to exist not just okay there's 20 strategies presented to the player but you should always pick strategy a and if yeah. you don't pick strategy a you're making a mistake that feels unbalanced right and i think this is what people are talking to the most when they say a game is unbalanced right if people are like oh the loki strategy is too strong in blood rage they mean strategic they're talking about strategic balance oh when you play dominion and the chapel is out you have to buy the chapel right they mean the dominion with the chapel in the market doesn't feel strategically balanced often right exactly okay so let's get into talking about maybe one of those buckets jake great so let's turn to the first of these sort of different types of balance which is asymmetric balance and included within that we're including player order because player order inherently is baked in asymmetry in games if i am starting first and brendan you're starting second in tic-tac-toe we can already see how clearly asymmetric those two starting positions are even if all of our other tools remain the same and that scales up to even games as complex as chess right where white just strictly always and forever 
has an advantage over black. Chess is not a, a balanced game. And there's things that they we do in the design of competitive chess play to account for the fact that chess is not really balanced. Exactly. Uh, and in our own modern board game hobby, uh, a lot of times this looks like asymmetric player powers, player factions with their own entirely different setup. Uh, it also might include different allotments of resources, etc. All of these things uh, that put players at a different point when the game begins. I think a lot of this too, Jake. So this is really important, right? Because this goes back to that question of, do all players have an equal chance of winning at the beginning of the game? And so much of that plays into, I think why this type of balance is so important is that it impacts the way we approach playing the game after the fact. And I say this only as someone who's played lots of games that have asymmetries where it doesn't feel balanced, though it probably actually is. So it goes back to when I have, I, you know, that cosmic encounter example that I've mentioned in the past, right? Like there's lots of wonderful zany alien powers in that game that let you do lots of stuff. And then there's relatively boring ones that are just like, you're the humans, you get like plus three in battle, whatever enjoy bon appetit and i think that that's one of those good examples right where that's probably actually really balanced cosmic is a i can't believe i just went there because that's such a complex case study for this episode that we're going to talk about later i think because actually asymmetric balance is very 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 difficult to achieve and we'll talk about like is that even a viable goal and how some games kind of skirt around like no, it's impossible. And, or maybe I don't want that as a design goal. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is so much of designing a game for player order slash asymmetric balance is sort of saying everyone can sit down at the table, look at the tools in front of them and say, okay, I'm in this. I have an equal shot at winning as Jake does, even though Jake is playing as the insane galaxy swallowing whales and I'm human beings. Right. No, that's a great point. I think it's a it's something that we go into the game trusting that if if I go to your your house and play a game that yeah. I've never played before uh and you tell me, you know, I'm the frogs or whatever uh, and you're the cats, then like I'm inherently be- going to believe that this game has been balanced in some way and we can like have profitable, meaningful decisions against each other. Yep. And when, you know, it becomes unbalanced, we would feel that in like, oh, we can't really have meaningful, the same kind of meaningful decisions because for some reason, one of these two positions wins the vast majority of the time or all the time. Some non-representative amount of time relative to our respective skill levels entering the game. And the same is true of player order, right? Where if you invited me over and you said, Brennan, I have this great game. It's called First Player Wins. We're all going to roll a die. Whoever rolls the highest value is the first player and they win. I'm not interested, right? Right, yeah. I'm not going to play that game. And there's this whole board set up that we just never get to because you just win. And at, at their worst, like at the you know comical end of this spectrum of unbalanced player order we've already talked about right that's like tic-tac-toe sure you know but it can happen it can manifest in way more subtle ways in board games we play you know at at their worst maybe we we didn't realize it but when we randomly chose the first player we did determine the winner of the game at that point and if we come to realize that obviously the game will no longer feel like a satisfying meaningful game to play Play experience yeah and I think a lot of that comes down to, Jake, designers giving, right, there's lots of things modern designers do to give small compensation to players for going earlier or later in turn order, right? There's going earlier, you have opportunity, going later, you have more information about what the game state might be, potentially, depending on the game, but like class, you know, okay, you'll start with one coin, Jake, I'll get two, the third player will get three, the fourth player will get four coins, right? So if you look at that within the context of whatever game example we're giving, I don't know how often that one coin ends up being all that meaningful, but psychologically, if you're in seat four and you start with four coins, four times more than the first player, it at least feels good enough that you're not coming at the game from this, oh, I don't have a chance of winning. Because if you didn't have that and you're in that first turn and you're like, oh, I would have gone to that place, but it got taken. Then I would have gone to that place and it got taken. Then I would have got to that place, but it got taken. So I guess I'll go here. That feels really bad. But if the game has like given you like okay i can think to myself well that's why i got those three coins or whatever right the other player didn't have so even if it doesn't actually meaningfully it's changed the practical balance of the game at least it psychologically is helpful so you know but 
to your point, it seems really unlikely to me that that one coin represents the exactly perfectly tuned amount of like nudge to make that seat exactly equal to all the other seats. It's quite possible by doing that psychological fix instead of first player going, you know, having the best odds, all of a sudden the third player does because having exactly three coins, you know, means they can do this space that costs three coins first. Yep. <laughs> and, and You know what I mean? Exactly. And I think that that's, we're going to talk more later on in this episode, or maybe if this goes on to two in a, <laughs> in a two part of this about perceived balance, because I think that's such an important part of balance in games, especially in a market where, on average, right? If let's say on average, someone plays a game two times, if over a hundred plays, the game is really balanced. And if players at high skill, it's super balanced in those first two plays. If there's imbalanced aspects that because you don't know the counter counter plays come out and let's say 99% of people only play it one or two times, your game is not really balanced, right? Yeah. Right. Like functionally in the real well, world. Right. It's who, we have to ask ourselves, who is this game balanced for? Is it balanced for the players who are playing it the first time, assumed no prior skill at all? Or yep. is it balanced for the professionals, you know, who are playing in tournaments or whatever, right? And they're in their 100,000th game of magic or chess or whatever. Jake with challengers. Exactly. Or challengers, of course. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the two totally different design goals that will yield totally different results and different experiences of perceived balance in the game. So this is one of the major ways, right? That people, when they say, oh, root, this game isn't balanced. Root isn't balanced. Cosmic Encounter isn't balanced or whatever. Usually they're talking about asymmetric balance or potentially not as often, but kind of c grouped in there, player order imbalance. All right. Let's move on to the other type that we've identified, strategic balance. So Brendan, do you want to give us an idea of what this is? Right. So this is once the game has started. Okay, we, we sat down at the table. We all have been given our starting we seat. We all believe that we, we believe. have an equal chance of winning this game. Yep. Now, once we're making decisions within the game, this is the idea that no matter the... That there are a variety of strategic paths within the game, so long as this is a game where there are multiple strategies that you can pursue. Uh, quick aside on that in a minute, but... <laughs> <laughs> you believe that there's multiple strategies or you're offered multiple strategies by the game and there are roughly equal-ish amount of opportunities for players given the sort of game state that you should pursue each, each of those strategies, right? Maybe strategy A isn't good in some games, but in other games, it's amazing. Strategy B is usually pretty good and strategy C is oftentimes not great, but if other players of this certain situation comes up, you can pursue it to counter a specific strategy. All of a sudden you have this nice balanced game that's really gelling. Um, so I put in our notes, Jake, that games aren't fun if you should just do the same thing every time. Um, and then one of our awesome listeners, Aurora, pointed out that that's not necessarily true and I contradicted and myself. And what? writer. And yes, and, and writer. Yeah. Yeah. And patron and friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Many titles that she has. But pointed out that's not really true because there are some games where you just, there's no strategic diversity, right? Like Azul, more or less, there's there might be some, like maybe I'm going to go more for rows or more for columns or I'm going to try to get two sets or whatever. But yeah. more or less, when I play the front side of Azul, I'm going to try to fill the middle column and then the left and right column. Or, you know, I'm mostly doing the same things. It's sort of like a one strategy game, but there's lots of other interesting decisions that are there. Right. Like in Azul, you always want to kind of like go towards the middle start and exactly. like build out from that and like you know, use all your pieces. But because there aren't different like paths that the game presented with you, I think that's the reason it kind of gets a pass on this. Like for, for my mind with strategic balance, I think there needs to be, you need to be presented with different strategic paths in the game. And exactly. If Azul doesn't have that, it's hard to like knock it for this right. category. It's, it's doing something else. It's being a puzzly interactive tile lane game but, but like a toy game example could be a game where you're playing the game uh and ag again like the asynchronous balance or asymmetric balance rather uh we have to like trust the designer when we're going into the game if if there's this made-up game 
uh, and you're teaching it to me. And on the first turn of the game, you have to go down the path on the left, the path in the middle, or the path on the right. I think the shared understanding we have as gamers is that we're trusting the designer that all of these different strategic paths have value in the game. And it's a more interesting, I'd rather play a game where there's three paths, each of which I should go down sometimes, rather than a game where there's three paths, and you should always take the middle path. Right. I think that would be an un, an unbalanced game, game, right? Especially if all three paths are presented as equal and at the start, right? Totally. And the if issue the game is-, is called like, go down the middle road, the king's road to win, and then there's like little offshoot roads at the start, I might feel differently than if it's, you know, equally weighted paths on the board, but then come to find out you should always Only go, down, go the down the right road. And this is, even if that was the case, to take it back to sort of the wrench you threw at the beginning, it's still a fair game. If everyone should always yeah. go down the middle and everyone can always go down the middle, it's a fair game. But it might not be a strategically balanced game. Right. And I'd rather play a game that offers a little more nuance because given the nature of the show, it makes for more interesting decisions if sometimes I'm supposed to go left, sometimes I'm supposed to go right, and sometimes I'm supposed to go down the middle. I just, Brendan, you're going to love to play my new game I submitted. It's called like Don't Go Right. (laughs) Don't Go Right. Nice. I can't wait. (laughs) Except for when you're supposed to go right. Ooh, dude. So when you we, know how to break the heuristic, you've truly mastered exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but so in, in strategic balance, right? I kind of just said this, but in this context, balance means there's nuanced judgment calls between strategic paths and in the game and opportunities to exploit weaknesses maybe in an opponent's strategy around when you go for what path. I see a Jake is going for a path for the left path. I'm gonna go the towards the right path because given the weather the right path is going to be faster or something like that right absolutely i I think when this is like really working and popping uh in a game you almost feel like the game like creates an ecosystem that can like grow and change as people sort of come up with new strategies and then uh new counters adapt to like combat them i don't know a lot about competitive chess but my understanding is that that is sort of what is happening that there's like a shifting kind of meta of openings and you know defenses and those are kind of growing and changing uh, as people play the game i think too you know we, we played guards of atlantis 2 recently which is a tabletop moba game a multiplayer online battle arena but it's a tabletop version And I think those games within just games in general, the broader category of games, end up being a really rich study for balance because I've played a lot of these games like Dota 2 or Heroes of New Earth or the original Dota. And when those games are at their worst, you just start the game and you know you have to like pick these. It's a 5v5 game and you're each picking a character. You just pick these 10 characters. That That's the whole meta. You have to pick these characters. They're the characters you play. Yeah. Even though there's 90 other characters. But at its best, you know, in like the world championships, someone picks like a character who's forever been a support and then they just play it as like this late game carry they show the world that like no there's this whole other way to play because the game actually is really imbalanced or maybe moba is actually after all are just about exploiting imbalances that no one else sees but that's a whole different topic some people are with you but probably not the Let's majority of our audience <laughs> Let's get back on topic. but i i do think you raise a good point and i think that strategic balance is something that is really prevalent in video games especially competitive Mm -hmm. uh, video games where there's a lot more like data around what strategies are like truly good and and not and we're getting that more today in board games than probably ever before just because board game arena is uh, a place that's like collecting a lot of data on plays and sometimes designers can even tap into that and and release balance changes to their game and what they're doing there is responding to like strategic imbalances where you know for whatever reason uh path a uh is resulting in a higher win rate than they would want for whatever their design goal is totally so jake if a game is strategically balanced that means that all strategies should work sometimes right yeah i think i'm with you that uh it definitely does not mean that all strategies have to have an equal chance of winning the game uh and i think that can be a frustrating thing to some players if the game is poorly sign marked 
or signposted, especially, you know, like I think one of the games that was brought up in our discord discussion on this topic was Teotihuacan, where you are building up this big pyramid as like one of eight actions on the board. And the all the action spaces are more or less equally represented in the space on the board. But then there's this giant wooden kind of pyramid <laughs> that you're building up in the middle of the board that, you know, does, I think, is trying to like signify like, yeah, this is about building like this temple of Teotihuacan, right? Yeah. Uh, so you need to, you can't, and I think my understanding of the game is that you can't or it is exceedingly rare that you can win the game without participating in like the building of this as like the main part of your strategy. And this is how do you like supplement that those actions with like other point scoring opportunities? Yeah. I think that feels strategically balanced to me as long as we're entering on the same page. Totally. And I think an important point here too, Jake, that we're going to talk about more later on, but is this idea that just because different strategies are going to have different, different risk and different payouts. And I think that any given game, you know, we're talking really broad terms right now, but any given game, you might be employing a few different strategic paths at once to form your sort of greater strategy. But just because sort of, let's say strategy A is when you take this, you're almost certainly no matter what going to get three points. Strategy B, you have a 50% chance of getting three points, a 25% chance of getting zero points, and a 25% chance of getting six points. Those those paths are still balanced, but there's different risk associated associated mm-hmm. with them, which leads to interesting decisions, right? And there might be third, fourth, fifth, sixth paths, and you're trying to choose between what combination of those paths to go for based on what paths other people are going for. A game that comes to mind to me kind of like this is something like Keyflower, where what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at the strategic outs that you might have based on the winner scoring tiles that you have and what other people are trying to do and figure out what paths will probably have the fewest people on them so you can co- sort of suck up the most points from them. Dude, you're so much better than me at Keyflower. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play it with you any time, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe. I feel like enough time's passed that I might give it another try. Interesting. Okay. So I think there's one thing that like I notice about strategically balanced games. So this might be shifting more into like what, how does like an unbalanced manifest here? Sure. And we talked about a little bit with like paths not being viable, right? Mm. That was like the path, you know, left, right, center. Uh, example but i think also i would consider like a strategic imbalance when a board position is like assembled that is like so unstoppable Mm, mm. right like i think this this is a good topic i don't know this is that's kind of where 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 i'm going with that do you think that falls into strategic imbalance i think this is a really important concept so at some point in time I think we're kind of past this moment, but there was like a poor, a point in board game design commentary of the sort of media that I was consuming where everyone and all anyone wanted to talk about is comeback mechanisms. If your game, game doesn't have a comeback mechanism, it is not worth pursuing. Like you have to have a comeback mechanism. And I think that this is, you've, un, you've unearthed the secret third category of balance, right? There's balance. This is the idea that you should have a, a roughly this like there's some games right like splatter gets thrown out as an example where you can lose the game on the first decision you make right did quote fingers he he thinks that's lame no i just think like it gets said a lot and i'm saying yeah yeah, too but you know yeah it's like yeah that's just like what you say about splatter whenever anyone mentions splatter they say that yeah 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 (laughs) so but anyway (laughs) I think that it the answer in this case, right, are is a game balanced if you can lose it in the first decision or in the first third or in the first half? I think wholly depends on the length of the game. Right? Okay. If if it's a 30 minute game and I've lost the game by the 15 minute mark, maybe I made really bad decisions and it's a game with high player agency and low variance and that's okay. If it's a four hour game and I can lose the game by the first 30 minutes, that might not be a balanced game, but maybe it is, but it also might not be a game that I'm super interested in playing. It just depends on the nuance and nature of that game overall. But I think in general, more people probably want to play games that they have a roughly fair chance of winning up to the halfway point. If it's a four hour game, than not it's, it's so, this is so hard. I think this is ex- what we're keying into now is exactly what has been really confounding me in this conversation. Okay. Because good. I don't think it's necessarily 
a strategic imbalance. And I don't think it's necessarily like an asymmetric unbalance, but like what happens when exactly what you're saying, like things all of a sudden become dramatically asymmetrically unbalanced at an inappropriate point in time in the game. Yeah. If that makes sense, right? It's like- You had it, a fair shot of winning from the start. All of the strategic paths were roughly viable. Yeah. Well, you just okay, picked wrong. I've got a good example. So Bruges, one of my absolute favorite games, has a card that the Astronomer, I talked about on this podcast before, that seems like wildly better than the other power passive powers in the game. Mm. In my opinion, and I think other people share this, if it's totally possible if you get dealt the Astronomer that you just play it on your first turn in the game and having that passive ability active that early on it's like you're probably just going to win like maybe like 90 percent uh and you know i feel like this game is mostly is like fair i think it's balanced at the start i think there are all kinds of different strategic paths to go down but all of a sudden the game became unbalanced because of this it's not it's not a combo in this case but it could be a combo of cards or just like a board position like like risk right? Like somebody gets Australia as like a classic sort of like example. Maybe that's not true anymore. I don't know. But you know, like all of a sudden the game is unbalanced now and it makes everybody else want to say like, I will quit. Okay. I have thoughts and I think that's a really helpful example. I think the astronomer card in Bruges is not balanced. I think yes. when that card exists and you get it early and it breaks the game, that's not a balanced game and it, it's not fun. When you are but playing- a How does that fit into, which categories that fit into? It's- it's like strategic imbalance, potentially like a little bit of like maybe player order imbalance if you just draw into it early or like asymmetric. I, almost, I don't know. It almost feels like a little different, like it mechanically does feel slightly, unbalanced. Yeah, yeah. Somehow. For sure. Which I think is kind of like a subcategory of strategic maybe. Yeah, yeah. But okay, then I think- that, the, that feels right. The example I was talking about before, the four hour game where you lose it in the first 30 minutes because you made bad decisions, but all else is equal with it being fair and balanced in terms of the strategies that are there. If players are playing at high top skill level, I think that sometimes this is another example of where people say like, oh, that game's not balanced. You can lose it in the first 30 minutes. Like, no, that game can be balanced, but it's just a really perilous decision space and you can blunder and lose it. And you can yeah. lose it way sooner than you would like, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily an imbalanced game. It means that there's a really high skill ceiling and it means all these other things. And you might not want to play that game, not because it's not balanced, but because the skill ceiling is too high and the play group that you have access to has too broad of a skill range and you just can't have a fair play of that game based on the skill of players who have are seated at the table. Does that make sense? I Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I think like... You maybe lost me like a tiny bit about when you said fair game, because I think that's like something where well, technically uh, with the way we define fairness before it would be fair because right. Players are entering with unequal skill and the person with more skill would win. It just wouldn't be fun, meaningful decisions. Totally. But I, I guess right. now we're going to go into nuanced philosophy land. But if I sit down across the table from Magnus Carlson to play a game of chess, is that fair? Yeah. He's devoted his whole it's life fair. to playing chess. I, I have feel, it. Well, yeah. Like the, <laughs> it's just. <laughs> the outcome is just. You've sure. made poor decisions and now you're going to lose the Magnus Carlson. Sure. I should have dedicated my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You fool. Yeah, yeah. How dare then, you sit across from Magnus? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, I agree with you about like, you know, Splatter, 18xx, right? Those are another game where you famously like, if you don't know what you're doing, you're in for a long one and you're going to lose and you're probably going to be out of it early on. (laughs) Yeah, I haven't played these games, but that's my understanding of those games. But I don't think either of us would say those games are not balanced. They're just perilous and it can feel frustrating for other reasons. Yep. And those are both examples of high player agency games. Something we'll talk about again, clearly now in part two of this, <laughs> what we talk about episode. I think our first ever uh, two part, what we talk about, but I want to talk about variable setup games and variants in general. Jake, is that, does that yeah. work for you? No, I that think sounds good. That's going to be really useful and sort of filling up this first part of this episode where we're talking about sort of the multiple types of balance. And I think that this is another way in which people often say maybe this game or that game isn't balanced. So this is the idea that like there's a variable setup within this game. So in any given play, the what strategies are viable can really shift based on that variable setup. So Settlers of Catan. Thank you. I'm glad you had an example. 
Right, in Settlers of Catan, what tiles are next to each other? Right, you have, yeah, you lay out the different... Terrains. Yeah, landscapes or whatever they are, terrains. Uh, and based on that, there'll be different strengths and weaknesses and whatever numbers they get. Yeah. And that can mean that at that specific play, a certain strategy might be stronger than another. But or even a certain position in player order. Right. And But I don't know that that necessarily means that it's imbalanced, but that's a design decision that focuses player skill in that game on assessing the game state, the opportunities presented to the player in a given setup, and that sort of thing. Because it shifts the skill maybe from executing a particular strategy to seeing what strategies you should be executing. Are you following? Yeah, what I'm you following think? you. I definitely don't think this is something this feels different, different from balance to me or maybe even as like a mitigation to balance. like i think a game that has random variable setup in some ways is lowering the skill floor right yeah. making it shoot how do i put this so yeah i don't know i don't know what i'm saying i've totally lost my trace can i i, just, I think what yeah, you're trying you to jump get in. at you I'm jump gonna, in yeah. I think what you're trying to get at is this idea that like when you design a game with variable setup, you're lowering the burden on the load bearing walls that you would need to strategically balance the game. Because through that variability, you're sort of saying every time you play this game, it's different. And that means that different strategies are going to be viable or stronger in a, in a given play, right. which means that maybe over the course of all your plays, there's a certain strategy that starts to emerge to feel less balanced than others. But in a given play, you're sort of less concerned with like, oh, this strategy is broken because you're thinking about what strategy is going to be best in this given game. And I think yeah. it's kind of a way that designers futz it it's in a good way. I'd rather play a game that has variable setup and is interesting for 50 plays than a game that, you know, has a static setup and struggles to be balanced in my first 20 plays or whatever. Right. Yeah, right. You, if you get a hand of five random cards versus like, these are your five starting cards. Those are just different play experience, but I'm not, I'm not sure it necessarily would serve to balance or unbalance the game. I think it what it does is like it interacts with like approachability and maybe yeah. the skill floor and skill ceiling in different yep. ways. Like I feel, you know, like a game with a lot of, of board that's like completely different each time. I might feel that is easier to approach and play with like an extremely experienced player than somebody who's like already familiar with the board because it's in a game where it's always the same right and maybe have like those like well-defined like heuristics of you know where to start out what regions to get to first what spaces to occupy right away if that makes sense yeah no it does i think another point to talk about here under strategic balance jake a little bit is this idea that like balance is contextual within the within each given game what i mean by that slightly and maybe this is the the wrong point and maybe you can give different language to this concept overall but like what so i'm thinking of innovation in emotep we've talked about emotep we've covered it on the show it's this phil walker harding game in which you're all putting cubes onto boats and then someone eventually is going to send that boat to a scoring location and based on where your cubes end up you're building these monuments and then you're going to get a certain number of points back and we spent a lot of time in that episode talking about how roughly you're going to get like between one and three points a turn. And mm -hmm. your goal is to get two or three points a turn yeah. as much as possible. And then I've also played a lot of innovation, this Carl Chudik card game, uh, where it's known for being enormously swingy. I get ahead early on. I have this really good engine. Then Jake draws into this cool card that lets him come back. He gets an advantage. All of a sudden, he's like blowing up, drawing cards like crazy, doing all this zany stuff. And it's really hard in a game like Innovation to say like, what's the average potential payout of a turn in the same way you can in Imhotep. And it's also much different to say like, this card is really balanced in innovation versus like this card is really balanced in Emotep because what they're doing in their respective games is just so different. Yeah. It's yeah. Like you can really in Emotep it's em Emotep and like similar sort of highly balanced, like very, you know, refined Euro games. Like you can imagine sort of the spreadsheet that's kind of with the math that between every space, right? And it's just easy to see your expected value or relatively easy to see your expected value of, of taking any given action. Whereas in a game that just has a lot more swingy elements, you know, it's, it's, you can't imagine, I mean, I have no idea what Carl Chudik's, that's a designer of innovation, right? Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, what his design philosophy is or, or how he designs games, but 
I don't imagine that there's like a giant Google Doc that has like the expected value oh, of every yeah. single card in innovation. Like this is like a four power. Yeah. Because it's I, just so situationally dependent based on all the other things that are in the game. Yep. And right. And that leads to swingy wins and losses. You know, if somebody gets a bunch of combo pieces dealt to them, I'm not really familiar with this game, but you know, it's similar in, in a lot of other kind of games. If you get the right pieces for your combo, you can just shoot off to the moon and snowball to a very quick or like a very extreme victory over somebody else. Yep. Jake, maybe a good place to end this first part of our discussion in terms of balance and what we talk about is the question of how often should the better player win a given game in a balanced game, right? So in innovation, I feel that's a, a hugely swingy game with really what feel like at times unbalanced powers, but it feels like a game where the better player wins a significant amount of time. When we did our Star Realms episode, we talked with uh, Paul Solomon, someone who, designer of Honeybuzz, Genotype, other awesome games, who has spent a lot of time playing that game competitively, said the best players in the world win roughly 60-ish percent of the time. I think it was like the best of the best win 63% of the time or 65% of the time, right? Yeah. Versus something like chess where like maybe the best of the best win 99.9% of the time. Well, yeah, sorry. Take it over. No, no, no. Okay. Well, it's I think a trick question. You right? had, yeah, because you have to compare apples to apples, right? If you're talking about, you know, Magnus Carlsen versus you and I in chess, it's different than, you know, Magnus Carlsen versus another person at the grandmaster skill level, level, right? Yep. And I think that's, I mean, I guess Magnus still just always wins. I don't know what his win rate is. But my point being like, you know, the, the top Star Realms players are playing against each other in the app system, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So play so that the the best of the best have like a 60% win in that environment, right? The best magic players win like, you know, similarly 50 high 50s percent of the time against other magic players competing at the professional level. If you or I were to play against, you know, somebody at the top of their game, they would likely be winning at a much higher rate than that. So what you're saying, Jake, is this question, how often should the better player win in a balanced game, is a trick question. And this is actually about skill ladders. How how broad is your ability to be skilled at this game? And also a question of variance. Right. How, how often can the worst player get and lucky? It's, and it's obviously, it's going to be personal preference. And I think actually a good example of how that manifests is in cooperative games. Mm. So like some people just don't want to win cooperative games very often or like especially on their first play. So I hear things a lot that, you know, oh, I want to only win 20% of the time uh, in, in a cooperative game. That's great. But like for me personally, I would probably prefer to win my games much more often than that. Um, and I think that's just going to come down to the player. And in a way, I feel bad that I've ended the episode here because it might it sort of has nothing to do with balance in terms of co-op <laughs> games because balance is like how many different strategies could you pursue to potentially win regardless of a, in that game, you're going to win 20% of the time or 50% of the time, which has more to do with the, the design ethos of, is this a difficult game or an easy game when yeah. we're talking about co-ops? And I think there are things that factor in that can help us to like guess what might make sense for our game. You know, if, if, the game is sufficiently random and variable to whereas the best of the best can only beat somebody brand new at the game 60% of the time. That's probably not great if the game is four hours long. Right. But it's perfectly fine if it's a, you know, five minute dice filler. Totally. And in either context could still be a balanced game. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, Jake, I feel like this was really awesome, and this was probably the most natural place for us to stop. But I want to give an, like a mouthwatering taste to our listeners for what's to come. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so in part two, our first ever two-part What We Talk About episode ever, so cool, we're going to discuss uh, perceived balance. We'll talk about player balance versus designer balance. We'll talk about why do we even care about balance. And we'll also talk about do games need to be balanced in general. And we'll talk about how games make sure that they're balanced, even when their systems set them up to not be balanced at all. Dang, that sounds like a lot. We'll see if we can get through that. Or three maybe parts. it'll be our first ever <laughs> three-part episode. Yikes.
<laughs> awesome. No, we'll get through it. Uh, all right. Well, I think that brings us to the end then of this week's episode. Our first part, what we talk about when we talk about balance. Brendan, thanks so much for joining. As always, we also want to thank our patrons so much for choosing to support the show. If you're interested in that at all, you can check us out at decisionspace.com slash Patreon. I feel like this is a really natural point to say that I want to give a special thank you to all the patrons, uh, the members of our quote unquote crew who in our special discord channel for patrons, the bridge uh, really helped out with our show notes. So Jim, Aurora, Obi-Wan, up to Manatee, Joe, AKA Carcassonne hater, Henry and Varanor. Thank you so much for just giving your thoughts uh, on balance and taking a look at our notes and improving them in innumerable ways. If you want to see our notes in advance of everyone else and before the show comes out, like our patrons, you can support the show. Perfect. All right. And we should also thank, uh, as always, Hembry for use of their song, Reach Out, which we use as our intro and outro. Thanks, y'all, and have a great day. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Cause I am reaching out